screen. Okay. Great. All right. So um, welcome, everyone. Um, thank you for joining um, us this evening. So before I would like, before I begin, I would like to just thank everyone who filled out my survey that I sent to you. Um, you helped me guide my choice in the topic that we're discussing tonight. Um, and joining me today is my mentor, Reverend Vernon Walker, who has helped me through throughout the work of putting together this meeting. And later on tonight, my coworker, Colin Betis, will also be joining and monitoring the chat if there are any questions or difficulties with technology. Um, and in addition to my fellow crew members, um, there's the crew hubs. And I would like to welcome the three guest speakers that I've recruited to speak on tonight's event in the order that they will be speaking, Mary Beth Groff, Lori King, and Emily Mew. And before diving into the introductions of the speakers and the agenda for tonight, um, I would like to start by briefly introducing myself and Crew's work. Okay, so my name is Olivia Blaney, and I have had the pleasure of being one of Crew's fellows for the spring semester. I'm a junior at Clark University in Worcester, Massachusetts, and I'm originally from Western Massachusetts. And at Clark, I'm studying environmental science and policy, and I have a spe specific interest in both conservation and environmental justice. Um, I'm excited to put all of my work this far at Crew together for you all this evening, and I would like to thank you all for your volunteer efforts, Hubs, as you have made my learning experience and understanding of environmental science outside of the classroom so much more enhanced. And as many of you know, Crew is a grassroots organization who addresses and prepares for extreme weather throughout the, with the three components of education, planning, and service. With these ideas in mind, I would like to frame today's meeting around the importance of education, planning, and service, and highlight how impactful the efforts of volunteers such as hubs are in the face of extreme weather. So the majority of us here tonight are very experienced and familiar with Cruise Hubs Network, but as a reminder, Cruise Hubs are volunteer community institutions such as libraries, churches, schools, nonprofits, local businesses, and others that help educate residents about extreme weather preparedness and other impacts of climate change. So cruise hubs can be classified as level one, two, or three. A level one hub being an educational and outreach center for your community and hosts at least one community event per year about climate preparedness. A level two hub fills the role of level one and also aids the community during the day in the event of extreme weather and communicates with their emergency managers about their action plans. A level three hub is a hub fulfilling roles of one and two combined, and in addition is an overnight shelter which has direct communication with municipal emergency managers. There are not yet level three hubs. So as a reminder, all of this information in more detail can be found on CRU's website under the Climate's Resil Climate Resilience Hubs tab. So with this information in mind, I would like to invite you all to think about the efforts in the face of extreme weather, working alongside of and in combination with volunteers and nonprofits at the local, state, and regional level. Okay, so before starting the meeting, acknowledging that with extreme weather comes many hardships and oftentimes essential workers putting themselves at risk for the well being of others. So in the theme of selflessness, I would like to take a moment of gratitude and solidarity to reflect and thank all essential and frontline workers who played a role in the resilience to COVID-19 locally and globally. If you or any of your loved ones worked during the height of COVID during the year of 2020 and or are currently acting as an essential or frontline worker, please plan to take the time to thank them for their efforts. Without the willingness to help and personal sacrifice from essential and frontline workers, I truly don't think we would be at the point we are today. So thank you all involved in that. Um, and here is an overview of tonight's agenda. So first, um, I'm going to introduce the three speakers. Um, then following that, there'll be three 10 minute presentations from each speaker, um, starting with the local level, the state level, and then the regional level perspective. And then there'll be a 20 minute panelist discussion on five questions that I will be directing towards the speakers. 
Following that, there'll be a 10 minute question and answer from the hubs to the speakers and any final remarks that the hubs or speakers may have. And then following the meeting, um, please be on the lookout. I made up a survey and I will be emailing you that. So that would be awesome if you could take the time to fill that out. And before I um, introduce the three speakers, I just wanna express my gratitude for their willingness to join us tonight and share their experiences and knowledge on top of their own busy schedules and many other commitments. So thank you to the three speakers tonight. Okay, so. Okay, so first I'm gonna introduce Mary Beth Groff. Um, so Mary Beth um, CFM is the State Hazard Mitigation and Climate Adaptation Coordinator at the Massachusetts Emergency Management Associate Agency, also known as MEMA. And Ms. Groff is responsible for the implementation and maintenance of the State Hazard Mitigation and Climate Adaptation Plan, through which she co-leads the Resilience Massachusetts Action Team the implementing body of the SHMCAP. Ms. Groff is also the state coordinator for the USACE Mass Silver Jackets team. And Ms. Groff is a former consultant with the private industry where she led a team focused on hazard mitigation and emergency management planning for the state of Florida, Division of Emergency Management and various US local governments. She holds a Master of Science in Planning from Florida State University and a Bachelor of Science in Coastal Marine Management and Policy from the University of Rhode Island. So at this time, I'm gonna invite Mary Beth to share her screen and um, share some of her knowledge with us. Wayne, can you get that computer? Oh, you're awesome. Can you see that? Yep. Okay, so thank you very, very much, Olivia. Thank you all for, for allowing me to come here tonight. And very best present. for seeing your presentation view. You are or you're not? I'm seeing the presentation view instead of the slideshow. Huh, because I clicked slideshow. Hold on. Did it go back? It did the same thing, right? Yeah, do you have two screens? Yes, that's why. Thank you. Hold on. You're welcome. Hold that thought. How about now? Perfect. That's it. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, but as I was saying, thank you all for for you know for allowing me to be here tonight and to talk to you about about emergency management, but really more about climate adaptation. So, you know, typically I, I don't use this cover slide this um, when I'm talking about what I do. So when you work for MEMA, Mass Emergency Management Agency, you have two jobs. You have a blue sky job and you have a gray sky job. So the mission of, of MEMA is to ensure that the state is prepared to withstand, respond to, recover and mitigate from all types of emergencies and disasters. So I highlighted the gray parts because during a disaster and when the state emergency operation um, center activates, which Emily will be covering more in her presentation, um, I have one role, but on a, on a day to day basis, my job is to mitigate, you know, hazard mitigation, um, basically planning for and strengthening against natural disasters. Um, and again, Emily will we'll talk about this, but does, all disasters are local. So it is up to the individual resident that you go to the, your local community who, if they can't handle the disaster, they go on to the state. And if the state can't handle whatever the resource request is, it goes up to FEMA. We, like I said, we activate the state emergency operations center and we, we um, manage any type of uh, natural hazard or planned large scale planned events, such as a Boston marathon, Boston fireworks, 4th of July fireworks, that type of thing. So to help give you context, so typically my blue sky job, what I do day to day, you have the four wheels of emergency management. You have preparedness, response, recovery, and mitigation. So obviously preparedness, you're preparing all year long. When something happens, you're responding to it. You go to recovery. I live in the blue world, the mitigation world. Mitigation, if done properly, is actually done throughout all 
all three cycles, the three other cycles. So as um, Olivia said, I'm the Hazard Mitigation and Climate Adaptation Coordinator at MEMA. And so I oversee and work with, I oversee the state's Hazard Mitigation and Climate Adaptation Plan, which the acronym is SHIMCAP. We love acronyms at, at MEMA. Um, and actually I think in state government, there's acronyms everywhere. Um, but in, so Massachusetts has had a hazard mitigation um, plan since the 80, 1986, I believe. Um, and every five years, it needs to be updated and reapproved by FEMA. So there's a set of criteria by which the plan must meet. In 2018, MEMA started working with and partnering with the uh, Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs. And through that, they combined the state's hazard mitigation plan with the state's climate change plan. And so that was done through Executive Order 569. In 2016, Governor Baker issued this executive order that um, that just moved and I did not touch it. Um, so the, the state, it, it required that the state's climate, um, state's hazard mitigation plan, like I said, be, co be combined with the um, climate change plan. And then it created also climate change coordinators. So there's nine climate change coordinators that are appointed by each secretariat that implement, help implement the SHIMCAP. And then there's also municipal short support, which Hillary is gonna be speaking to. Um, in 2018, the environmental bond bill was signed. That actually codified uh, executive order 569, which includes the municipal vulnerability preparedness program, um, which Hillary is here to talk about. But it also authorized um, over 200 million in, for climate change adaptation and $2.4 million bond um, bill to focus on climate change resiliency. So the combined plan, uh, the, the shim cap as we call it now, we, Massachusetts was the first in the country to actually do that, where we combine the two. It, is, it acknowledges that climate change is, is actually worsening and that we integrated um, information and planning for 14 natural hazards that affect the Commonwealth. At the time, it used the best available data and projections to assess risk and vulnerability, not just for backwards looking, but actually forwards looking. Um, it also evaluated the state's existing capabilities to implement the you know, agency specific and statewide activities. Now, local plans were rolled up into it, so we do account for that, but the state's plan really focuses on state agencies, what our charge is, what we're responsible for, our mission, um, and all of this information can be found at resilientma.org. So the Resilience Mass Action Team is co-led by Maya Mansfield at EEA and myself at MEMA. And this is kind of the chart. So as I said, the core team are the climate change coordinators that are appointed by each executive office. They sometimes, some of the executive offices assign an alternate, some don't. Below that tier is the SHIMCAP action lead agencies, meaning that when we, we develop the state, the SHIMCAP, you look at your risks, you look at your vulnerabilities, and from there you, you formulate and you create mitigation strategies to help ameliorate damage or, or impacts from future hazards. And so there, those actions are led by specific people at the agency. So this is just a, a sampling of agencies that, that work with the RMAT closely because their, their actions, they have actions in the SHIMCAP. And then we have project specific working groups depending on what we're working on. Right now, we're focused on the Massachusetts Climate Change Assessment which is the beginning stages of an update to the shim cap. And so now we're looking at climate change, not only from state assets, but we're, we're broadening the scope and we're pulling in external industries. So there's five sectors um, and it's not, like I said, it's not held to just state agencies. It is also uh, private industry. So we're looking at energy, we're looking at infrastructure, we're looking at human, so there's, there's five human, natural, um, environmental um, resources. And then um, I just went blank. Uh, so I'll, I'll get back to that in a second. Um, so RMAT is charged with updating and maintaining the, 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 all the actions in the plan. And so at the same time, we're also looking forward. And so we created some working groups to help us 
move forward and make the state more resilient. And we launched, also we launched a climate resilience design tool, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, we launched the resilientma.org, which is a clearinghouse for data, tools, and trainings based around climate change, climate risk. The mass climate assessment will be completed in October of 22. And at the same time, concurrently, the SHIMCAP is going to kick off next month and it'll be being updated the same time the climate assessment is being conducted. And when the climate assessment is done in October, that will then be folded into and rolled up into the SHIMCAP. The other thing that we do as a team is we, we are very fortunate that EEA is able to dedicate some state funds towards implementing the actions in the SHIMCAP. And so each year we manage a, a it's not really a grant. I mean, we're, we're, we are giving agencies money to actually implement the work that they say they wanna do. And so one of those actions um, that EEA undertook in the very beginning was the Climate Resilience Design Standards Tool. And that was done, primarily we wanted to, we partnered with um, admin and finance agency, ANF, in order to ensure that when any state dollars are being spent, it, a project, it has to be a physical asset. It has to go through this tool to ensure that the, the project is, is being designed in a very resilient way. So this tool is a planning, preliminary planning tool that is designed to help a, help a project manager understand that the project is not, um, will not be severely impacted by natural hazards or climate change. And so EEA led this, this process along with, with MEMA. And we also pulled in multiple agencies, both state agencies, local communities. We pulled in private industry to form and, and inform this, this tool. So it, it can be found on resilientma.org right now. It is ending its kind of pilot stage, if you will. We're about to launch a, a phase two of it, which will be out the third week of April. And so that will be more of a version. It will transition from a pilot into a versioning um, tool. So the other thing we're doing, as I said, was the climate change assessment. We're providing a risk assessment that will feed up into the state hazard mitigation plan. It's evaluating climate stressors, so temperature, precipitation, sea level rise, um, and climate hazards such as extreme heat, flooding, droughts, and across the five sectors. So we held a series of public stakeholder engagement, which was wave one. I'm sure some of you um, hopefully have heard of that. It was put out to to, to everybody. It wasn't held to just state agencies. It was open to all residents of the Commonwealth. At the same time, we've been working with state agencies and federal partners and some of the private partners that are part of the sector working groups to understand to develop a short list of impacts. Um, we are just conducting right now the, uh, the second wave of that impact shortlist and we will have a final, finalized list in June of 22, and then the assessment will be completed in the fall of 22. The, the, we will be holding a second wave of, of stakeholder engagement, and that will be um, sometime probably late May, maybe early June, but keep a lookout for an invitation to that because it's open to all all residents of the Commonwealth, although there is, a, there is a focus on environmental justice and climate vulnerable populations. I'm not gonna bore you with this, but this is just, we designed the method on a 2020 New Zealand assessment and it, we did it in a way so it's data-driven, transparent and replicable. replicable. Um, and it's just, it's important um, to also note that it's not just a state view, we're actually gonna drill down um, and, and assess seven different regions throughout the Commonwealth. The other thing RMAT does is they work on other actions. So this can also be found on resilientma.org slash RMAT underscore home. And so the Department of Housing and, and Community Development has created a toolkit for housing, um, the transportation, um, DOT has done a climate initiative. So all of these tools and different plans and studies can be found on Resilient MA. 
The other thing that it is done through MEMA is a local hazard mitigation planning. And that is very similar to the state, but it's based on a local, at, at the local level. And a process for communities to identify policies and activities and tools to implement mitigation actions. Um, it is, it is really, the, like I said, it's, it's, you, every community has to have one in order to be eligible for FEMA funding. So this is just another way to look at, at risks um, and to look at your risks and vulnerabilities, but it's also very similar to the MVP program. Um, and so you can kind of combine the two and that way when you're, when you're looking, you're adding your climate um, vulnerability through the MVP planning process and you have the, the FEMA programs and the FEMA re uh, requirements through MEMA's local hazard mitigation planning process. And so by having a FEMA plan, it opens you up um, to being eligible to FEMA grants. And like I said, um, if you combine the MVP building community resilience with the FEMA hazard mitigation planning requirements, you really do have a, a complete plan um, that's very similar to the state's hazard mitigation and climate adaptation plan. And so this is just my information. Thank you very much for your time. And I think you're gonna take questions at the end, correct, Emily? Um, yep, we'll do questions at the end. Thank you so much for sharing your screen. That was great. Um, and I'm just gonna share my screen and we will have an opportunity for questions at the end. So one second. Okay, so um, I would like to introduce the next speaker, Hillary King, who's going to be speaking from the state level perspective. Um, Hillary works for the Mass Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs, the EEA, Municipal Vulnerability Preparedness, MVP grant program as the Central Regional Coordinator. Um, she's one of the six regional coordinators who administer and provide technical assistance on state MVP grants. Hillary has a particular interest in researching nature-based solutions and sharing best practices to inspire the work of others. With a foundation in landscape architecture and planning, experience working with engineers on public infrastructure projects, and now working for the Commonwealth, Hillary hopes her work helps communities to plan for and achieve a more resilient future in our changing climate. So I'll just turn it over to Hillary, who can share her screen and start her presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Olivia. Let's see. Can you all see it's Massachusetts climate action slide? Yes. Yes. OK. Well, great. Um, thanks for having me here. Uh, I'm excited to share about the MVP grant program. And I, I think there's a, a lot of overlap uh, with crew and some opportunity for um, collaboration. Um, so I guess taking off from where Mary Beth left off, I just want to start with an overview of climate action in Massachusetts at the state level. Um, I work under the Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs, uh, where we have a climate team helping to lead climate action in the Commonwealth, um, including developing and supporting policy through research and funding. Um, we have staff uh, working under the Global Warming Solutions Act, creating a roadmap for decarbonization across all sectors of the economy. Um, we have others like Mary Beth um, and um, others in EEA focused on making changes to and preparations for state services and assets relative to climate hazards. Like Mayor Beth mentioned, rising temperatures, changes in precipitation, sea level rise, and extreme weather. Um, and we have another group um, helping municipalities plan for and take action at the local level. Um, the, oops, sorry. Back. Um, so my work as a grant coordinator for the Municipal Vulnerability Prepared this program means um, I talk a lot about the current and projected uh, climate impacts we're seeing in our communities and what communities might do about it. Um, the MVP program was set up in 2016 after Governor Baker 
signed Executive Order 569, which among other things provides funding to municipalities for climate resilience work. And talking to Olivia, we thought it might be helpful to provide the working definition of climate resilience used by the MVP program. In this particular instance, we're talking about the ability of a community to address the needs of their built social and natural environment to anticipate, cope with, and rebound stronger from events and trends related to climate change hazards. And I guess the key here is that resilient communities continuously build capacity to reduce future climate impacts. Um, and just to take it a step further, um, you know, talk, thinking about the, um, the different components of the state's climate team, we generally talk about mitigation on one side of the house, which aims to reduce the causes of climate change and then adaptation and hazard mitigation strategies that rely on our ability to, to change and try new things in order to adjust to what we're seeing in climate. Um, you know, on the mitigation side, uh, not to hopefully, um, you know, not tell you something you already know, but, um, you know, actions under mitigation might be like developing and implementing energy efficient technologies and employing uh, renewable energy to help cut down greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and then on the other side, um, you know, we know that things like clear cutting land for large buildings and paving large areas are causing more climate harm and things like better protecting our wetland buffer zones, building green roofs and walls, creating bioretention for stormwater and growing pollinator gardens are ways to help improve our ability to, to thrive under different climate conditions and build resilience to extreme weather resent, re events. Um, so the MVP program is more on this adaptation side and we also kind of live in this what I'm calling the sweet spot, you know, where there's cross-cutting strategies that can have overlapping benefits um, that both mitigate and adapt to climate change. Um, and thinking about maybe some of the work that CREW does, you know, helping us educate each other and, and take steps um, individually at home, uh, at work and other places in our community. So MVP, um, supports two grant types. The MVP planning grant enables communities to start cross-sector conversations around climate change and discover how diverse stakeholders in the community can collectively build capacity to reduce the impacts of future climate events. Um, much like the shim cap that Mary Beth was speaking about for state government, you know, this takes a local approach and looks at um, you know, at an even fi more fine-tuned level at our communities and, and what's in them. Um, the MVP program prescribes uh, and funds a community-led planning process that makes local knowledge sharing and collaboration its cornerstone. So for these planning processes, municipalities commit to contribute at least 120 hours of time to prepare for and attend the required workshops. And um, results from these workshops lead to local and regional climate action and inform other local plans, um, help with grant applications, and provide information to develop um, policies. After the planning process is complete, communities are eligible to apply for our competitive action grant funding, um, which is state funding available to implement priority adaptation projects. Um, a few topics that come to mind have included stormwater management improvements, water and energy conservation, um, improving communication with vulnerable populations, and creating resilience hubs. Um, I think it's important to note that these grants are contracted with municipal governments. However, it's strongly encouraged that municipal staff engage with community members outside of town hall to develop and implement broad reaching climate resilience strategies. Um, and I'll be happy to talk more about um, administrative specifics at the end if there are questions, but in the interest of time, I'll keep moving. Um, this is our grant status map, 95% 
of Massachusetts cities and towns have completed or are participating in community resilience planning. And MVP has awarded over 200 action grants over the last five years. All said, the program has provided over $65 million for this work to date. And yeah, so you can see the, the blue communities have completed um, and are eligible for action grant funding and the ones in yellow are currently completing and the ones in white we're still reaching out to and are eligible uh, for planning funding. Uh, as I've mentioned, the MVP action grants are selected through a competitive application process. Um, and there are nine core principles that guide the program's project selection and funding, which include um, furthering a community identified priority action to address climate change impacts, or in other words, something that comes out of a community's MVP plan. Uh, utilizing best available climate change data for a proactive solution, employing nature-based solutions, increasing equitable outcomes for and supporting strong partnerships with environmental justice populations, conducting robust community engagement, achieving broad and multiple community benefits, um, committing to monitoring project successes and maintaining projects into the future, utilizing regional solutions toward regional benefits and pursuing innovative transferable approaches. Um, and I wanted to look at the chat, um, see who's here, uh, people from the Berkshires and um, Back Bay and Cambridge. I'm glad to see you all here. Uh, I'm not sure how um, familiar everyone is with the crew mission and values but I spent a little time on your webpage last week, grabbed them, um, and they really seem to have a lot of overlap with MVP core principles. Uh, things like empowering community members, actively addressing structural inequities, fostering long-term awareness, and supporting work that provides mutual benefits. Is it healthy, sustainable, equitable? Um, these are all things that we look for in a good MVP project. Um, so I guess thinking about collaboration, um, I really like this graphic from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration or NOAA's Environmental Literacy Program. It is meant to present a vision of a resilient community, which depicts the institutional players that might be involved in community resilience education and key approaches that have been identified as effective pathways for change. Um, some of the most effective MVP funded projects are already using some of these um, approaches, like uh, just to blow some up a little bit um, or enlarge them, like engaging citizen scientists to map and measure or monitor the health of an area, providing more people with an understanding of the issues, vulnerabilities, and actions for resilience, um, and then specifically targeting certain groups like youth, um, either through special events or school curriculum development, helping to ensure knowledge is passed on to the next generation and you know, helping spread the word to their families. Um, so hopefully I'm uh, approaching this correctly and thinking, you know, about what the crew hubs have the potential to, to do and um, guide in their communities. Um, but I'll just give a few project examples and then head it, hit, uh, hand it back over to Olivia. Um, so uh, just a few quick ones. Um, I'm looking at one in Medford, in Springfield, and um, one down in Falmouth. Um, so this project in Medford um, was a six month community process where project teams looked to answer key questions to inform the creation of resilience hubs in town, like, you know, what do our residents need to be most prepared? What do our community provider organizations need to do their work in emergencies? And how can we work together to support our residences? 
Um, and I think through this process, they were really able to um, identify some service areas and start reaching out and getting in touch um, with vulnerable residents. Um, but this actually ended up leading to an additional funding project the year after to expand on the work, um, building trusting relationships between the community and government leaders. And so they've had a lot of community events um, and listening sessions, um, and it's, it's still on its way to identifying where and exactly how these community hubs um, will be put together for the city. Um, this project, um, similarly, I guess in Springfield, um, they were looking to increase the resilience of their, what they called community infrastructure. And they created um, a position in the city called a Resilient Springfield Resident Advisor Council. Um, or, or group, not a position, sorry. Um, so they were working with city department heads and senior staff to complete a racial equity assessment uh, in public employment and improve communications and outreach to the city's most vulnerable populations. Um, this is an interesting project uh, in Falmouth because it's the completion of a multi-decade restoration effort that resulted in restoring um, a groundwater fed stream on Cape Cod. It included restoring the herring run, the wetlands, and it enhanced um, the public hiking trail network. And just because it's fun, you know, here's a construction project, a uh, construction photo, and a couple um, finished product photos. Um, it's worth mentioning that there were many community partners from you know, high school art department to elementary classes, members of the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe and local organizations that run um, continuous programming along the river. Uh, I have a couple more, but I think I'm a bit over time, Olivia, so I don't know if you wanna hand it over to Emily, but I look forward yeah. to doing questions with everyone after. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, that was awesome. And I appreciate how you connected um, what you do to Crew's mission. I think that's really awesome. Um, so now I'm going to just introduce our last speaker, Emily Mew, and then we'll break into questions that I'll direct to the speakers. And then the last part will just be for the hubs to ask questions if they have them. So just one second, please. Okay, so um, the last speaker for tonight is Emily Mew, and Emily is the co-chair of the Mass VOAD, um, which stands for Volunteer Organizations Active in Disaster, and the State Coordinator for Emergency Disaster Services for the Salvation Army, um, the Massachusetts Division. So um, Emily, whenever you're ready, you can go ahead and share your screen, and we're looking forward to hearing what you have to say. So thank you, Olivia, and thank you to the other presenters. Is this um, not coming up? There we go. Um, so I think my presentation is going to take a drastic turn <laughs> from the previous two presenters. Um, if only because, well, first, it's going to be far less technical. Um, I don't have the kind of knowledge about climate resiliency and mitigation that the others um, obviously have a lot of. And um, also because what I'm going to talk about is more about what happens after um, an extreme weather event or any other type of disaster that may that may happen, um, specifically in Massachusetts. So um, I work, so Olivia did say that I, I am the co-chair of the Mass um, VOAD. And uh, as much as I like to talk about what I do in my Salvation Army job um, as the state coordinator, I do love what I do. Um, but I decided to focus this presentation strictly on Massachusetts VOAD because that's really why um, I was approached by Olivia to begin with. 
um, to present tonight. So um, I'm happy to answer any questions regarding Salvation Army um, and what we do. And Salvation Army happens to be, um, along with crew, a member of the Mass VOAD. And I'll talk about what that means in a little bit. Um, so, I mean, I may be able to kind of pull from both of my um, professional roles um, if, you know, if anybody has any questions later. Um, so as, as I said, I'm the co-chair of the Mass VOAD with um, Eric Olson, who is um, a volunteer with Team Rubicon. Um, so he's actually going to be stepping down soon, and we hope to elect somebody new. Um, but I do just kind of want to read just a general, um, just, you know, what the purpose and mission um, of the Mass VOAD is, which is um, to foster more effective service to people affected by disaster through communication, coordination, cooperation, collaboration, convening mechanisms, and outreach. And I know that's kind of a mouthful. Um, but um, VOAD is actually a national movement. There is a national VOAD and um, also a six state VOAD um, that we're a part of and we're technically members of here in Massachusetts and every single state across the country has its own VOAD and some larger cities um, like New York City, for example, has a New York City VOAD. Um, and in some communities, there are actually what something called a co-ad, um, which it's, I don't know if there was, I know I saw that somebody was from the Berkshires um, and there is a Berkshire County co-ad. I don't know how active it is. Um, and there's a Pioneer Valley co-ad um, that is um, in Western Mass as well. And um, those, those are, Kind of follow the similar, the same similar guidelines, um, and term in terms of like getting together, figuring out needs, um, addressing those needs in a coordinated effort. Um, and there are there are possibilities for growing the coads or developing new coads in you know in regional areas, much like those two that I just mentioned. Um, basically, the VOAD is a coalition of organizations um, that have disaster response or recovery as part of their mission, um, or, you know, whether it's part of them. Oh. Um, sorry, I just, I have children in the background, so um, <laughs> if I'm distracted, it's because somebody's coming to talk to me. Um, so, um, so this is a list of many, this is not a complete list. Um, and some of these organizations are for more, far more active um, or regular members of our meetings. We meet um, monthly and it's virtual. We used to, before COVID, when it was, everything wasn't virtual like it is now, um, we would do four meetings a year and they were in person and not a ton of people were able to come because this is a statewide coalition. So, um, so, now that you know they, we have this virtual option, we're doing doing monthly meetings, and some of these organizations have representatives. Most of them have at least one representative, or sometimes two, um, that sort of represent their organization and come to the VOAD meetings and can speak on behalf of their organization. So you know something, someone like um, just as an example, the Boston Food Bank. They may not have like the words, I don't know what their mission statement says, but they may not have the words disaster response in their mission statement, but obviously they're going to be involved. Um, hold on, a, hold on one second. Um, so, sorry about that. I knew that they would talk to me right at the moment that I, it was my turn to present. <laughs> no um, <laughs> so, um, so as I was saying, so the grass, the greater Boston food bank may not have the words disaster response in their mission, but obviously they're going to be involved if there's a statewide response, which, you know, talk about COVID as a statewide disaster, obviously the greater Boston food bank um, was a, a, a key, a key a key organization um, in that in that response. Um, 
so I have this uh, just logo Slack logo up there. I don't know if any of you know what Slack is, but it's an online um, tool that you can use for communication. And so many of these organizations are members of that um, or have joined our Slack platform. And so like during a disaster or in preparation for something that's coming, you know, whether it's like a hurricane, like on re that was, you know, we did so much preparation for that as, as a, as a convening organization um, and just communicating back and forth about who, you know, who has what resources and who can provide what and when. Um, and so that's, you know, that's just why I have that up there, but you can just, I'm not going to obviously read all of these, um, the names of these organizations, but you can just take a quick look and, and see, you know, who's involved and crew, as you can see is up there as well. So, um, uh oh, did my slide change? Um, no, we're still seeing the Slack logo. There oh, we go. There it is. <laughs> Um, okay, so um, I think Mary Beth did a fabulous job talking about MEMA, um, so I don't need to explain to you what MEMA is, um, but one of, a, one of our key, they're not, a, they're not technically a member of VOAD because they have to be a partner since they're a state agency, um, but we work very, very closely with MEMA. Um, we have a seat at the ESF6 branch table. Um, which is, as you can see, Mass Care, Emergency Housing and Health and Human Services Branch. Um, and we also have a MEMA representative um, that um, is, you know, works at, at, out of MEMA um, and communicates with us, mostly with me, when there's a need. So Mary, in Mary Beth's presentation, she described a little bit of how, you know, if a local there's a local disaster and the local community can't address it, they bring it to the state and then the state will reach out to their partner agencies to see who can help. Um, and we're one of those, one of those agencies. So, um, so typically um, I'll get, you know, an email from Paula, who's the, our MEMA representative to say, you know, what the needs are, um, then, you know, I'll send it, shoot it out to all of our distrib you know, all of the people on our distribution list, which are all those representatives that I mentioned a slide ago. Um, and then, you know, say what the need is, whether it's you know muck outs or um, debris removal or food or you know whatever the need is, um, then we will coordinate with all of our agencies and figure out how to address those needs. <clears throat> um, so our role, I, I don't know if I said this, um, but I will say it again, we are not necessarily a response agency. Um, we just do the coordination between all of the, the response agencies. Um, so for an example, a hurricane comes through and destroys homes on the Cape. Um, and we hear that there are, um, you know, debris everywhere, um, power outages, muck outs are needed, foods needed. Um, we will coordinate with the agencies that address those needs and figure out who is doing what um, when, so for example, we'll communicate with Southern Baptists and Team Rubicon who do the debris, debris removal and muckouts, um, and maybe with an online tool called Crisis Cleanup, where people can, individual people can come and, and say what their needs are locally, um, and then we'll help um, the umbrella organizations or the statewide agencies um, sort of figure out who's doing what and how and when. Um, so all of those organizations represent themselves. So, you know, if we're, if we're activated, if, if VOAD is activated, we're not sending out a bunch of volunteers as VOAD um, volunteers, they're going out as volunteers for their own organizations. So they're gonna be wearing their own, you know, Red Cross shirts, Salvation Army shirts, um, Team Rubicon shirts, um, but just doing it on behalf of the VOAD because we, they were requested from the state. Um, we have adjusted sort of our way of activating where it used to be only through MEMA, we could only activate through MEMA, but um, we've shifted over the last few years to, to, to have it be sort of more um, mutual aid. So like if one organization or if one community comes to us somehow um, and says these are needs, you know, we can bring that to the VOAD as opposed to it being only through our MEMA rep. Um, and of course, there's no cost to disaster victims or displaced people. Um, it's all volunteer organizations doing the work. So 
um, there's no, you know, there's no fee or anything like that. Um, so these are just, this is not a complete list of um, things that we are able to address and coordinate for, um, but these are sort of the bigger, more typical um, um, ways in which we can help. So like disaster case management, like longer term. So when, you know, folks need some long-term assistance, you know, we, there are some of our agencies do that sort of work. Um, Red Cross being the obvious one, um, but also Salvation Army can take clients, you know, who have longer term needs. Um, don donations management. So obviously when there's a large scale disaster, donations come like streaming in. And we all say that that's the disaster after the disaster. So you need organizations that can, that can assist with figuring out who, you know, where items go, how is it managed? warehousing, all of that. Um, emotional and spiritual care is another, you know, disaster mental health. Um, I won't go through the long list. You can read, you know, read yourself, but um, these are just some of the, some of the ways in which we come together and, and coordinate the, the appropriate response. Um, and just as an example, so I just wanted to, you know, um, we, so even we don't always fall like everything we do doesn't always fall into one of these categories either. So, um, for example, for example, the ESF six table um, several months ago during during actually this was no it was more than several months ago but it was during the beginning um, time during COVID when um, the it was still the two week quarantine and um, we had. Our MEMA rep called us and said, um, you know, there's a person stuck at Logan Airport and they were traveling from Europe and heading home to Florida um, and they had their layover in Boston. So they didn't know anybody in Boston. Um, and it turned out as she got off the plane, she was developing a fever. So they tested her. She was positive for COVID and needed to quarantine in Boston with no resources or people that she knew. And so they came to the VOAD and said, you know, this is the situation. Like, is there any way we can help her? Can we figure out how to get her, um, you know, a way to quarantine for these next two weeks? And, and several of our agencies that um, are part of our coalition came forward and were able to pay one or two nights in a hotel. And so a whole bunch of us together um, were able to, you know, come to the table and, and, and provide this assistance when it was nothing we had ever done before. Um, and so it's just, there's always just ways that we creatively think through problems and try to help them based on what the needs are and based on what um, our organization's resources are. <coughs> some, some other examples of some of the things we've done recently, um, I'm not gonna go through every single one of these, but I'll just pull out a couple that are particularly interesting. Um, the diaper drive. So early, early, early on in COVID, when um, you know food and resources were no longer on shelves, um, diapers in the greater Boston area was an enormous need, um, and we were able to, through one of our contacts in in Calif one of our local contacts here, had a connection in California with Baby to Baby, which is a an organization that donates. Um, diapers, we were able to sh literally accept a, sh a truckload from California here. And one of our member agencies dis agreed to do the coordination of the diaper um, drive and get diapers out to um, other local organizations in the greater Boston area who were requesting diapers. And so <clears throat> it was just a really great example of the coordination piece and the connection piece and, you know, pulling together resources and making something happen um, locally here in Massachusetts. Um, local fires, I mean, I know this is not really addressing the extreme weather um, topic that we're, <laughs> that we're, that crew really specializes in and obviously Hillary and Mary Beth specialize, specialize in, um, but, you know, for big fires that can often be because of very cold weather or something, um, we, we very commonly um, come together and address needs for individuals who have been displaced and resource recovery centers is one of those ways that we do that. 
Um, and the bottom left picture is um, a picture of a resource recovery center in Leicester with a really big fire where there were like multiple apartments um, destroyed and many, many people displaced. And um, all of the agencies that have resources that they can provide will come to, to that, lo that locale. In this case, it, I think it was um, like um, a community center or something in the, in the center where they come at a table, it's like a one-stop shop. So the people who are displaced can come through and sit at each of the tables. And, and many of our organizations were there. Um, animal, animal resources, um, which is Central Mass DART. Um, Red Cross, Salvation Army, Tzu Chi Foundation, um, and um, housing and development, like they all come so the people can go from table to table. So they're not driving around to all making appointments with all of these um, different organizations, but they can come to one place and, um, and, and meet everybody all at the same time. So it's a really convenient way to get services out. Um, and that's actually it. <laughs> um, so th that's my name and contact information. Um, Eric, who I told you was my co-chair, he's stepping down. So I wouldn't contact him, um, but because he, he's literally within the next month. Um, and so he's not really available. But Jeff Lynn from the Tzu Chi Foundation, he is our secretary. Um, and so the three of us together, we really um, do most of the, the bulk of the work when it comes to the coordination piece, obviously not the, the, the response piece, um, but uh, it's really, it's a really great um, entity to, to help with local, regional, and statewide needs. And that's all I got for you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Emily. You're welcome. All right. So um, I'm just going to take over the screen green sharing from you. Yes. Thank you. Um, so now just like being mindful of time, um, the meeting is scheduled to go until 715. So um, I'm just going to ask these questions to the speakers um, for the next like seven minutes and we'll just see how far we get and then I'll turn it over to the hubs um, to see if um, they have any questions for the speakers. Um, and no worries. Thank you for joining, Bevy. Um, so, okay. So um, if the speakers are ready, I'm just going to ask these questions and feel free to jump in and answer um, however you want. Um, you don't have to answer every question. Um, but the first question um, in your work, whether that be addressing the aftermath of extreme weather or preparing for extreme weather, how have you used or seen local knowledge used to be the most successful in those efforts? So I, Emily, did you, were you gonna? Only because nobody else was talking, go ahead. <laughs> okay. So what I was gonna say is, I, I mean, I can talk about this from my gray sky job perspective um, and a little bit from my blue sky, but really more from my gray sky. And, and certainly Emily knows this and, and deals with it more, on a more regular basis than I do. But, you know, local knowledge is the only way we at, at the State Emergency Operations Center is able to really truly understand what is happening on the ground post disaster. So without that communication connection with the local community, um, we wouldn't have, you know what I mean? Like we wouldn't be able to control or, or help facilitate resources and the disaster without knowing what's actually happening. So it's really critical. Um, I mean, primarily we deal with the emergency management directors at the local level um, or police or fire depending, but yeah. That's that's a critical piece to it to to responding to a disaster. Um, I'd like to reiterate uh, second that and say um, it's everything for what we do. I mean, we like I literally, if I'm trying to find out specifics about what's happening on the ground, I will contact the most local person I know to get that information. So whether it's the emergency manager, whether it's the fire chief, whether it's um, you know, a, a volunteer in that community. Um, so anybody that's local um, that has a hand in, you know, community events or community um, situations, then that's the person that I'm going to look for. 
Awesome, thank you. Um, unless anyone has anything to add, I'll move on to the second question. Um, so after hearing about crew and crew's voluntary hubs, how do you see the work of the hubs lining up with the work you are doing in your professional life? And was there ever an instance where you or your company worked with or even relied heavily on efforts of nonprofits and their volunteers, such as cruise hubs, to prepare for and or address extreme weather? I go ahead, Hillary. Yeah, I, I think I can take this one. Um, just, you know, as I mentioned in um, you know, the slideshow that you know, MVP really focuses on centering community voices and using these existing networks. Um, and I, I think I think it was a native, well, it's a Charles in the Charles River watershed. Um, I believe that crew helped to um, to complete their kind of engagement strategy. Uh, they were um, let me find my note here. They were um, putting together a Charles River flood model to um, forecast expected flooding under different climate conditions. Um, and the members of crew helped lead their extensive community engagement effort, uh, which had its own challenges during the pandemic. But I think um, through your resources and connections, they were able to re you know, really connect with um, 15 communities across the watershed, whether it was municipal um, employees or different groups within each of those municipalities um, to talk about this work and why it's important and bring their personal experience into putting together this model. Awesome, thank you so much. And um, we're actually currently still working with the CRWA um, so that's great that you brought that up. Um, but yeah, um, and if anyone else has anything to add, um, they can go ahead and do so. Otherwise, I can move on. I, I would like to add, um, so this, the climate change assessment that we're actually in the process of, of conducting now, typically, you know, it's not really drilled down to the local level, but this time we are. So that's super exciting for us. And so I again, and I will pass on the next time that the, the, the information for the meetings is rolled out, which I expect to be in a few weeks. Um, I'll certainly get Olivia the, the information to, to share out to all of, all of you, but it's really imperative because we are looking down to the finest, the you know, local level of how they're being impacted by climate change. And so it's really important to get the, the, that local level voice so we can understand it more um, in depth. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, and I think we have time for one last question. So I'll go ahead and read that. Oops, sorry. Okay, um, so the third question, um, can you think of your time during your career that you felt your preparation for extreme weather or your post extreme weather care would have benefited or been more effective with the help of hubs or other organizations similar to those? Um, and if not, I can move on to the fourth question as well. Um, well, I, I mean, I, I can say like, I can't think of a specific example, but I can think, uh, I mean, like, so some of your hubs are shelters um and either day shelters or overnight shelters and so i mean i can that i, I work with shelters on a regular basis in both my full-time job and with um the voad so i mean i i can see that you know having those contacts and and knowing that information and being able to reach out directly to individuals um would be extremely helpful because they probably also know if there are other you know whether it's a warming shelter or whatever, um, and like local resources, that's what we're looking for all the time. Yeah, awesome, thank you so much. Um, I think we're going to move on from these questions and there's not any 
clubs here tonight, but um, those of you that are, if you do have any questions in general for the speakers or to a specific speaker, um, now would be the time to um, use the right function or type your question in the chat um, because there's really no one here. You can just go ahead and ask your question. Um, yeah, and if there's no questions, we'll just move on. All right. <laughs> okay. Um, so we're just about out of time. So um, we'll just move on from there. And before you go, um, I would just like to thank the speakers, um, the hubs and the crew team members that were able to take time out of their night and participate in the event today. Um, and I would like to thank all those involved with Crew's efforts for welcoming me um, this semester and allowing me to get involved with such great work, both the employees and the volunteers. And I think you should all be so proud of the impacts you're making to face extreme weather. And before you go, I just wanna remind you that I will be sending out a follow-up survey. It should only take about five minutes to complete. So I'd really appreciate it if you could do that. And lastly, please continue to keep up the amazing work preparing for and addressing extreme weather. Your hard work does not go unnoticed. And it is with all of these efforts together at the local, state, and regional level that we will find the most success. So um, thank you speakers, thank you hubs, and have a good night. Thank you, Olivia. Thank you, Olivia. Yes, thank you, Olivia. Thank you everybody for, for joining tonight.